now we're getting down into the level of individuals with drones and smaller groups of people with drones, and we have a great panel. Um, let me just introduce everyone here, uh, and then uh, to my right, first we have um, Joseph Hall, who is the senior staff technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and he writes frequently about security and surveillance and, and, and a lot of these issues. Uh, Matthew Waite, who's a journalism professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, who founded the Drone, Drone Journalism Lab. Uh, to help students and faculty explore how drones are used in reporting. Uh, and Captain Don Roby from the Baltimore County Police Department, who is a training program manager uh, at the Airborne Law, Enf Airborne Law Enforcement Association. Um, a, a quick personal story on this. I am not myself a drone flyer, but um, I had a, a fun sort of encounter with this and the, and, the, and the unique problems that maybe we encounter with trying to fly drones for recreational use in D.C. Uh, but some friends of mine who run a very good blog called Lawfare um, got it in their heads uh, last year that they wanted to have a drone smackdown competition. And the idea was that they were each going to build using a Parrot drone that they were allowed to mod. A Parrot drone is one of these small four rotor things that you can get at Brookstone or on Amazon for a few hundred bucks. Um, you could modify it to within a few hundred dollars and essentially they were going to try and weaponize it. No ballistics so it couldn't shoot anything. You know, People were putting like chain mail and dental floss hanging down to go into the rotors and like sticks on the outside and stuff. And we got this bright idea that we were going to go do this in Fort Reno Park and I was going to be the referee. And Fort Reno Park is, you know, up in northwest Washington. And they were advertising this on the blog to sort of get the readers excited about it. And we got what effectively I think could count as a cease and desist order from the FAA Whoa. saying don't try it. <laughs> Um, there had been an issue with another DC resident a couple weeks before who had flown a drone, I think over in Adams Morgan, and he maybe had lost track of it, and he got a note about that. So it was a very interesting sort of encounter. And what we realized that basically is like these things that I think could rightly be called hobby aircraft were being told you can't fly them in DC because of the air restriction around Reagan National and the mall and all the rest of it. So and as the FAA looked at this Parrot drone with dental floss on it as basically a flight risk. So we had to go out to Manassas and do it anyway. And NPR covered it, and it was really fun. So you can go listen to that sometime. But it was sort of an interesting introduction to like what happens when individuals get hold of this stuff and all of these sort of uh, potentially really fun and interesting uses, and then the way that can sort of collide with policy and regulation and law on a very personal level. So we're going to get into a lot of this kind of stuff. And what I want to do is actually just to start with something very specific. Um, Don, I want to ask you, I mean, you come from you're the law enforcement side. We've been talking a lot about the public safety applications of this technology. Just give us a sense of how Baltimore County Police Department is using this stuff right now and how your colleagues in law enforcement are using it or want to. Well, we don't use it in Baltimore County. We're a very traditional aviation unit with three uh, large hel helicopters. Um, what law enforcement is using this for, um, or they want to use it for, is for search and rescue. We want to use it for crime scene photographing, you know, and there could be protected areas on that too would require a search and seizure warrant for uh, traffic accidents, um, things of that nature. We also, a lot of our aircraft and law enforcement gets used for other governmental uh, uses. We assist the fire departments. We also do work with uh, our environmental protection people for, you know, runoffs and things like that. So that's what you're seeing. Uh, you also will see it for like tactical operations in which they would come up and they would, um, uh, just check the rear of a yard, make sure there's no suspect in there, then move a SWAT team in or a tactical team into that area to secure it. And that's really what they're using it for. Nothing about persistent surveillance. I haven't heard any talk about persistent surveillance in our circles. Everything's been operationally necessary. And a real quick up flight, check something out, bring it back down. I mean, you can imagine if you have a missing child in a wooded area, a small confined area, how easy it would be to take one of these devices out of the trunk of a car, launch it, check that small area, then move on and start checking other areas. And that's what we're seeing, very operationally, uh, you know, situations like that. And that's where we're going with it. Uh, and is it, is it expensive? It is a large part of the budget to do that? Or is it, you realize, tremendous savings by... Very, a lot of savings. Most of our... Uh, uh, helicopters like we would operate in my, where I work are very expensive per hour to operate. And if you start talking about an uh, unmanned aircraft system, a UAS, small UAS, you're talking pennies on the dollar to operate it for just a few minutes. You could clear it in an area very quickly. Okay. And so, so Matt, you run a, a, journal, a drone journalism lab. Tell us about that and then what you're seeing as the potential use um, for, for people like me, like you who do reporting. I mean, what, where, where is the technology going to take us? Um, Weirdly, the answers are, are a lot the same. It's uh, the, the kind of uses that I see are um, short, go up in the air, get us perspective on something, come back down. Um, 
maybe fly around an area, maybe not. It really depends on the kind of skill of the operator. Um, things like natural disasters, things, uh, environmental change, uh, growth and development, anything with like a large spatial extent uh, is where, where uh, my mind has gone uh, on a lot of this. And the, uh, the economic argument actually is the, the, the winning argument here for, for journalism is that those TV news helicopters are multi-million dollar aircraft and they cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to maintain and fuel and hire a pilot and all the things like that. When you're talking about something you can buy for less than a thousand dollars and do just about what you need it to do, um, it's a really, really powerful argument. Uh, it opens up gigantic questions, um, but I think the, the kind of basic use for photo and video is, is, is pretty obvious. It doesn't involve a lot of imagination. And are there journalistic organizations doing that now? There are TV stations that have them or newspapers? No, um, because the FAA has said, nah. So um, we have a kind of a limited window that we can, we can experiment with uh, as a university, but uh, I get calls pretty much weekly from um, general managers at news, uh, at television news organizations, editors at newspapers, website operators, people like that saying, okay, I've got my credit card out, I wanna buy, what do I get? And I'm like, hold on, let's, let's talk for a moment. Uh, I, I often tell people that I feel like the dream crusher. Um, I said, you know, just hold your credit card for just a few more years and, and we'll, we'll be able to talk. Is, is, when you say the FAA says, says no to it, I mean, is it, is it no in the way that they said no to me and my buddies flying in Fort Reno Park, or it's, is it? It's the commercial restriction. Okay. Because um, if it's a for-profit making journalism. Exactly. Yep. They, they consider journalism to be a commercial purpose. End of story. Um, I, I've said all along that if, if that were to go away, but all the other restrictions would be in place, have to stay under 400 feet, have to be away from people, have to be far away from an airport, um, can't fly over built up areas, you know, people's heads, anything like that, we'd be in the business. Right. I mean, there's stories to be done out in the wide open spaces. Um, but that commercial restriction just, that, that pretty much ends it. Okay. So Joe, you're coming at this, you know, you write about this, you're coming at it from a policy perspective, you're thinking about the social implications. I mean, one question I want to ask you is, real, I asked this with, with Missy and with Michael, realistically, how long do you think it is, in your mind's eye, before the technology is, let's assume it's available legally? and that it's cheap enough for people to get it. How long until sort of everyone has a drone? I mean, I'm not saying it's ubiquitous as having a cell phone, but where you or I could go get them and it's not a novelty anymore. Well, I, I think that's right now. I mean, you can get pretty capable um, drone platforms uh, with various kinds of sensor packages right now. Um, the trick is, is that, you know, I think what you're seeing in terms of sort of the public reaction and sort of a visceral, react, visceral reaction is that you know, we want to integrate these things not only into our airspace, but into sort of the fabric of our society and do so in a responsible way. Uh, in my PhD, I hacked voting machines. And one of the things we learned there was that we had introduced, you know, networked and computerized voting machines just instantaneously after the 2000 election. We hadn't taken the time to figure out, hey, these things are actually pretty bad. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we, I see similar things here in the sense that we want to make sure this is done responsibly. I don't think you know, there, there are some voices that say no drones at all, and there's some voices that say no regulation at all, and I think it's, it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know where it is, you know, but when you start having these things co-occupy manned space, manned airspace, um, and when you start having things like the thing that I always think about, the thing that's sort of my litmus test, and I still don't have a good answer for this, is what if, you know, a major corporation starts flying um, automated license plate reader drones and has sort of like a search engine where you can put people's license plates in and see everywhere where they're driven. I think that sort of brings a lot of things together in that sort of thought experiment in the sense that not a lot of people w would enjoy that existing. Um, there's not a lot that regulation can do to stop that kind of a thing. Um, but it's the kind of thing that is, it will happen eventually. And is it worth sort of the chill on our ability to freely assemble or to speak? Um, and you know, another sort of privacy-related interest to, to to do that, or should we have a more sort of normative discussion? And you know, people like the the, the AUVSI and the, um, as as um, Don had mentioned in a in an email, the International Association of Chiefs of Police have sort of these codes of conduct for doing these kinds of things responsibly. 
but from a lot of other industry areas, I've seen codes sort of slip over time as, mm -hmm. as, as people realize they can sort of get away with more. Um, and, and so I just want to, you know, at, our, at CDT, our interest is sort of balancing, balancing the innovation and the public interest in using these technologies. And so that's part of the conversation. You, you, this topic of persistent surveillance has come up, and Don, you mentioned this right. as well. I mean, this idea of having a, a, a flying platform, essentially a flying camera over a large area and watching it all the time. And you mentioned potentially even reading license plates. What does the law say, or what do we think it says, about the ability of uh, either a governmental agency or even just an individual to watch someone with a camera like this? I mean, uh, the Supreme Court is, has said if you're going to put a GPS tracker on a car, you need a warrant to do that. But do I have an expectation of privacy if I'm just walking down the street? Uh, there are security cameras, probably 15 between here and the next block. But what does the law say about that? Sure. So um, I'm not a lawyer, although I may play a good one occasionally. I'm sort of half a lawyer, half a computer scientist. Um, but um, it, it's clear that you know when the government is operating a surveillance platform and doing so um, in places where people might expect privacy, might have a, what we call a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, you need a warrant, you know, premised on probable cause to, to to collect that information. And you have to do things like minimization. You have to make sure you only collect. Um, data that's relevant to the investigation. Um, for for private use, it's much it's it's much more broad. Um, there are some things that are clearly no nos, like voyeurism. You know, using uh, you know, a little tiny drone to view in someone's bedroom is going to get you in, in in a lot of trouble. Um, I think <laughs> weaponizing drones. I don't, I don't understand the fascination with that because it's just it's kind of uh, maybe it's just that's the extreme or whatever. But clearly. Um, shooting drones or having drones shoot things is probably, you know, it's, that, that's a totally different thing entirely. But there's sort of like these voyeurism aspects, peeping Tom aspects, video surveillance, you know, these things that, you know, have been that, that, that over the years policy law has said, okay, you can photograph pretty much anything in public, but when you get up to that point where uh, people have a, an expectation of privacy, that's when we're going to feel the need to come in and, and stop you. So expectation of privacy in my home, Dom, maybe you want to speak to this, but this is not necessarily walking down the street. Right, exactly. I mean, like you have no expectation of privacy for your tag number. That's why you have license plate readers. Where the problem comes in to, what do you do with the data that you capture? Who has access to it? And how long do you keep it? And it's the same thing with UASs. What are you doing with the data, the images? How long are you keeping it? And what are audit controls and controls that you have in place to make sure it's properly viewed? And then it's taken out of the system and it's purged out. There, that becomes the problem. Uh, let's face it, most of us in here, we've advocated a lot of our privacy away. We, we have with our phones, they track everywhere you go. It's horrible. It really is. It's, it's absolutely horrible. And you're shaking your head. I totally and completely it's, disagree. It's, what's that? I totally disagree. Okay. okay, but you have in a way, I mean, Apple can tell you where you are with your iPhone at any time. We have to get that. We have to get a court order to get that if we need that. And that should be the same thing. If it's an expectation of privacy, we should have a, need a search warrant or a court order to access that. And that's how we do it. And we don't, no bones about it, are the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police Guidelines, we say that. No, no case law, no what it says, and if you have if this, the curtilage of a house or there's an expectation of privacy, you have to get a search and seizure warrant for it. That's why there's no carte blanche for using these on a crime scene. There's crime scenes in the back of a yard. Mm -hmm. That's the curtilage of a house. You need a search and seizure warrant to process that. And you would have to do the same thing to take the photos from there. You'd have, have to include that in there. So we, we look at it like that. I'm probably, I'm, probably the, yeah. I'm probably the furthest from being a lawyer on, on the sure. panel here. Um, I would say I'm not a lawyer, but I follow a lot of them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> there was a, there's an interesting argument um, actually in that drone, uh, Jones GPS case about, uh, it was in one of the ascending opinions about how um, that kind of persistent surveillance of the government knowing uh, where you assemble, when you assemble, and who you assemble with as being anathema to your First Amendment right to free assembly. Um, so there's hintings of some constitutional problems with this kind of persistent surveillance idea, uh, even in public places. Um, so it's not totally foreign landscape right. here. Right. And you, you also say, even though you're not necessarily dealing with, you're not a lawyer, but you, you're operating within a, an, an, an ethical sphere as a journalist. So yes. when you talk to students or to editors and news organizations, I mean, have you, have you started developing kind of a code of conduct for how to ethically, as a reporter, use a drone? We are uh, in the process of doing that now. We have been um, trying to 
develop our own <coughs> platforms and actually get them in the air and kind of see what um, what capabilities they have and, and what what journalists could do with them. Which I'll tell you right now, if you're worried about journalists getting UAVs and flying them, I'm here to tell you you can relax. Journalists are horrible pilots. <laughs> um, so, um, if they're automated. <laughs> <laughs> We actually had a funny, uh, funny revelation that uh, we were really scared when we tried um, just simple waypoint navigation, and we realized that the uh, when we turned it on, it was actually flying it better than we were. Um, wow. So, <laughs> uh, which probably shouldn't have been that surprising. But yes, we're 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 attempting to do that. And and when I talk to my students just about ethics and about journalism in general, what I tell them that is that what journalists, the power that journalists have is attention. We can draw attention to a thing. And that attention can have uh, positive uh, effects, and it can have negative effects. And so this uh, technology enters into that fray. And um, for the foreseeable future with journalists using UAVs, they're going to draw attention to themselves, um, and not in a whole lot of positive ways, uh, at least so far. Uh, I think there are uh, a number of um, attorneys who are interested in the rather novel uh, legal avenues that uh, this will present in terms of uh, libel and false light and, and um, things like that. There's um, a number of interesting laws being passed, uh, like California's anti-stalker laws. Uh, um, there are a number of ag-gag bills being passed in farm states that make it illegal to photograph a farm. Well, you put a UAV, you put a camera on a UAV in Nebraska, you're photographing a farm. You don't have to get more than 20 feet off the ground and you're photographing a farm somewhere. So that's going to be a real problem um, for somebody like me. Um, so yeah, we're, there's, there's a significant amount of work to be done in terms of developing kind of rules for the road for journalists that go beyond the law. Like, what, you know, the FAA says you can do this. Um, local uh, laws say you can do that. There's a third layer, and it's that ethical layer of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, I wonder if I might follow up. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if it's your university, but I think a university in North Dakota has a what's essentially an institutional review board for research-based uses mm -hmm. of the UAS and UAV platforms. I'm wondering, you know, essentially for those of you who have, haven't had to deal with that, you put your proposal in front of a board, and they make sure you're ethically operating a research instrument like a drone. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you th is that appropriate? Is that is that may be very unfamiliar to journalists, but you know, yeah. uh, it doesn't allow you to act very quickly. But maybe for longer investigative pieces, you could sort of have a, a community policing function. It's it's a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I know that um, the journalist in me is like, oh, it's ooh, a ooh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, um, but. Um, We've talked here today about how you know the, the kind of responsible uses in the next few years are going to be uh, really key, and in, in that uh, abuses over the next few years will be will be magnified because they will be the first. Mm -hmm. And I have said to my students, to my faculty, to my dean that I am not going to be the one on the on the front page of the paper screwing this up. Um, so that that may be. We have not gone that route yet. Um, I'm not certain you're going to, you would probably ever see that in terms of uh, the professional sphere. Yeah. sphere. Um, but there are codes of ethics that have somewhat been adopted uh, that are somewhat followed, and we think that's certainly a direction that we're going to pursue. Um, honestly, my feeling about this all is that um, even after we get, uh, we get aviation policy in place, everybody and their brother is going to get sued. And it's going to be a few years before courts work through a lot of these things. Um, and that's when the real work will start, is that kind of three to five years after we actually get aviation law in place. So you've talked about <clears throat> you, know, you have a professional kind of ethical obligation that keeps that in check. Obviously, with law enforcement, there are rules, there are laws, there is oversight. You know, I've always thought, though, that you know, if you're talking about the sort of mass proliferation of these drones and everybody get one, gets one, you know, the real kind of risk, I guess, comes from, 
you know, somebody putting you know, a, a drone the size of a spider in their ex-wife's <clears throat> apartment and spying on her, uh, private detective type stuff, spying on your neighbors. Um, it, maybe it's you know, theft, it's a little drone with a grappling hook that goes over and steals something. <clears throat> Is that realistic? I mean, do you think that as this technology proliferates, it sort of brings out people's bad instincts? And then how do you even realistically counter that? I mean, that, that, that gets down to the level of almost such low level kind of petty bad behavior that can you really stop that absent any kind of just shaming of it, I guess, mm -hmm. publicly? Well, um, <clears throat> so uh, Margo Kaminsky from Yale has a great paper um, called Drone Federalism, and the idea being that we may need to allow the states and local localities develop specific types of rules for the road for these kinds of things, um, because there's typically sort of that kind of law and regulation that sort of bounds the federal sort of, um, you know, uh, wiretapping type of stuff and, and, uh, uh, and sort of free speech, you know, free for all. Um, and I think that's a good way to think about this. I mean, you definitely hit the nail on the head. There's going to be things we can't even think of. Like I think of some of my researcher friends making, you know, sensor networks of moats that they sort of drip over, you know, a household or a bunch of them or something like that. Um, um, but, you know, I think what, what Matt said really resonates is that we can we can only predict so much, and then when it comes down to it, we're going to have to to really work this out as sort of a, a social and policy and and you know commercial negotiation of, as to what's right. And um, the bad actors are the ones that are going to get a lot of the press. Um, let me ask. I want to take sort of the um, <clears throat> recent real world events and ask us to sort of reimagine them um, if, if drones are sort of on the case. Um, and Donna, I want you to answer this question first, just from a pure law enforcement perspective. Mm -hmm. If there had been drones doing persistent surveillance over the Boston Marathon, would it have made any difference in spotting uh, the alleged bombers, or would it have made any difference in the immediate uh, aftermath of the of the rescue? I think what had a very really. Uh dramatic impact on, on the response because you have that eye in the sky you're looking down to reallocate your resources, clearing areas and, and so forth. Would have prevented it? Who knows? I, I don't know. I don't think any of us, you know, could really answer that. But I think it gives that incident commander the, uh, that, you know, situational awareness to move the resources where he or she needs them and get medical help in there, rescue crews and law enforcement in there. And as people are taken out, it would assist them in clearing areas. There's a suspicious package here, there, or whatever. Um, but, I mean, fixed surveillance did a pretty darn good job finding out who did it. Right. So we, we had, you know, we had, we had it. So. Now, to take a phase two of this question, if we're five years in the future and this has happened and many of the residents of Watertown have a drone, and there's a manhunt on, and the residents of Watertown put their drones up and start trying to look around the neighborhood and almost crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing the search. Does that change something? Is that, what does that look like? Chaos. <laughs> really loud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you all think, though, that there is there, I mean, is that, is that too far out to imagine that individuals with drones in moments of crisis would say, you know, I'm going to put, the, I'll find the guy, I'm going to put this to use, I'll do it, I'll canvas my block. Well, keep in mind they shut down the airspace mm -hmm. uh, over, over the city of Boston. So I've, I've had a number of people call me up and say, well, you know, how could we have covered the, the manhunt with, with these? Could we, have, could we have been flying around? Could we have found them? I'm like, no, they shut the airspace down. You'd have been in big trouble. Right. Um, you probably would have been in the back of a squad car getting a talking to. Um, which is not where you want to be on a big story like that. Um, so, you know, for me, that's an easy question. You know, it's like, could you have covered it differently? Nope. I also, you know, I tend to think about, um, you know, journalism is the kind of thing, it's such a protected type of speech that, you know, I, I want to see us figure out a way to do these kinds of things. And, you know, you think of there's been a number of collisions of news helicopters covering a, a, the same event, um, and you get arbitrary drones in that mix too, it gets kind of crazy and something that, that we sort of have been thinking a lot about and it sounds like some, it resonates with some folks is this idea of a, of a license plate and, and Dr. Cummings probably is going to laugh at me for being so, so lowbrow, but the idea being that um, drones that are going to co-occupy manned space need to broadcast a signal saying where they are, how fast they're going and an identifier so that we can look up, you know, what that drone's doing and, um, and that could also be useful from by other manned aircraft knowing sort of what's around them and you know, you know where they can maneuver and maybe even having cordons where you say look this is a specifically you know cordoned off area where UAV platforms can operate and, and, and you're gonna have a lot of them running into each other or whatever maybe not um, maybe they can avoid each other 
Um, but you know, I th there's, you know, that's what I think about when I think of emergency situations and having either citizens or, 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 or small, um, low resourced response, you know, covering those kinds of things. We, there's there's going to have to be both policy and, and technical solutions to make that work without having, you know, fire and brimstone. Right. And, and to be clear too, when we, when you all are talking about the applications of this technology in your respective fields of work, you're talking about relatively low flying, localized. You're not talking about drones going up and flying in the jet stream with you know no. Delta jets or anything like this. So does that seem like a fairly workable system to let communities figure out how they want to allow drones to fly in the neighborhood? Uh, personally, no, uh, because it would just create. I mean, it, it's. There are 39 states that are considering their own li uh, limitations on UAVs uh, in their own airspaces, which is going to create a, a kind of a nightmare scenario of, hey, I work for CNN, and oh, there was a tornado in X state. I'm now on the car. Well, I've got to figure out what the rules are there. Mm -hmm. If it's every city and every county and every state, um, it's, it would just be bewildering trying to figure it out. Um, is there a one-size-fits-all policy? No, but my uh, my immediate gut instinct is like, well, that's just chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be I impossible to to work with, uh, unless there was some kind of national uh, resource that explained what the rules were in every jurisdiction. And and to be you know part of this kind of drone federalism idea, you had to submit whatever it is the rules were in your community and how they differed and everything else, and there was some kind of structured way, but that'll never happen. I guess yeah. I don't worry so much about that in the sense that, um, you know, there's been a, a lot of, there's a lot of good resources for FOIA, for, you know, the party laws, of, you know, um, associated with recording stuff, but I guess when you get down to you know, I know like there's certain Midwestern states don't even have counties, they have townships, and it gets into the like, tens of thousands per, <laughs> per thing. That oh, we have counties of 500 people. In yeah, Nebraska, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, what are your thoughts on well, how I, it works I, at a local level? I think at a local level, you have to engage your communities with the policy aspect. I think the regulatory will be done by the feds and by, uh, you know, powers to be there. But we, we have to engage our communities. And what, what will the community accept? That's the most important thing. They, look at Seattle. The community will not accept UASs in Seattle. They're not flying them. Right. The police, they, they okay. specifically have prohibited the police department exactly. from using them. Exactly. So you have to engage them. You have to educate them. I mean, right now we see a story about a law enforcement UAS and it's a predator drone. That's the photo in the magazine. Every it's time. Every time. Every time. It's a predator drone. <laughs> and now we're talking things under the five pounds. Very small, small devices. Well, how do you go about it? I mean, in, in Baltimore, how do you do that? I mean, how do you tell people you know, look, we're not going to be using this thing right. to peer in your window. Right. Or, if you, or if you are, you tell them when it's okay to do that. I mean, right. like, how do you actually physically, you know, communicate to them? And, and, and are they concerned about that? I think you have to let them see your policy. You have to post the policy. It has to be transparent policy. They have to be able to look at it and say, whoa, time out. We're not going to allow you to do this. We'll allow you to go out on search and rescues. We'll allow you to look, you know, to go out on traffic accident scenes. We'll allow you to clear a yard for, you know, tactical operation, a fire scenes, you know, those, those types of things. But we're not going to allow you, allow you to do criminal intelligence gathering or whatever. And each community may be different. You saw the surveys out, how, you know, the variety of responses there. But if, if we don't engage the communities, we're going to have them against us on this. They already are to some extent against us on this in a lot of areas across the country. Yeah, it does seem like there are pockets. I mean, Charlottesville, Seattle, there are other examples Absolutely. where there seems to be almost a community resistance right. kind of welling up and creating little models right. for how to do that in right. other jurisdictions. It's about education. We have to educate, educate the citizens. I mean, if, 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 if Baltimore County suddenly had a prohibition on this, I mean, it wouldn't, I mean, how negatively would that affect your ability to do search and rescue? I mean, I take it it, it would, doesn't. It wouldn't because you're not really doing much of no. it right at the well, moment. Well, we, we do it with helicopters. Right. We do yeah, it yeah, right. with, yeah. with man we have, systems. We have hoists on our helicopters. We do it that way with man systems, you know. I think this doesn't impact major departments. What it impacts is the smaller departments that can't afford a traditional aviation unit. And, and as such, that when you get into that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar market and be able to get federal grants or whatever to obtain that equipment, that impacts them. They'll never get into the traditional aviation unit, but this is an avenue for them to get into some aspect of aviation. Okay. Oh, well, there's an exact same sure. argument uh, for journalism. <coughs> well. um, what law enforcement deals with is, uh, is the public, um, elected representatives of people. Um, journalism, it's the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that 
many news consumers would bat an eye uh, if I were flying a UAV over a, or a tornado path right. uh, and showing them the extent of the damage. Uh, the moment I stalk Lindsay Lohan, the market's going to react poorly um, to that, at least I hope. Judging um, <laughs> <laughs> um, by TMZ's traffic, I'm not well, sure. Well, yeah. hil hilariously, yeah. uh, my phone lit up like crazy when <coughs> a, a false report that TMZ had applied for an FAA permit had gone out. And everybody's asking me, is it true? Is it true? I'm, I, I have no idea. But when it turned out to not be true, they were asking me about this. I said, well, the reason everybody believed it was because it makes abundant sense <laughs> right. that they would want to do this. That's why we all believed it. It was because it just made sense. But th it's that marketplace that's going to do that, that same kind of reaction, and it's, and it's going to be what, mar what your market will allow you to do and what will allow you to get away with. I just want to ask you all one last round of brief questions because I think the audience is that uh, there's a lot of people here, and I know they're going to want to interact with you. But just briefly, let me go around. Um, one of the things we want to get at in this whole conversation is how if we think this is a good idea to have a drone of one's own and that this is technology that can be useful in any number of ways um i guess a, a the question is a do you think that's true and we should be encouraging wider adoption of that technology and b how would you go about doing it in a practical way if you, if you have some ideas on that Let's start with you why well, is it a good idea well i think mike said the computers are around would you say 50 years mike and uh then all of a sudden now we have cyber crimes so I think uh, we're going to probably have some of this with UASs and so forth. It'll be a, a tool of a crime or instrument of a crime. I mean, you could see that going down that path. Um, but I think it's going to be widely accepted as time goes on, as these devices get smaller, more technical, the, de the um, uh, systems on board, the, the imaging systems and, and sensing systems become more uh, sophisticated that you will see them being applied more and more in law enforcement and public safety. Mm -hmm in general and by government. You will see that, okay. you know. I'll make a devil's advocate argument. Um, I, I do believe that there is a positive application of the technology and I do believe that there are a number of industries that should be pursuing it. But I'll make, I'll make the devil's advocate argument that everybody having a drone of their own is a terrible idea. Um, because, um, speaking from, from hard personal experience, mm -hmm. um, when you, when, you, when you graduate up from the kind of toy size, when you get it a little bit bigger, now you're talking about four, six, eight, 12 inch long blades spinning really, really fast. So now you have a flying lawnmower. Um, and I'm not good at flying it. Uh, my students are better than, than I am, um, but we've practiced a lot and we've practiced at some really confined and, and kind of safe places. Not everybody's gonna do that. And so a whole community of flying lawnmowers sounds outright <laughs> terrifying to me. So that's the devil's advocate argument I'll make, that, that everyone having a drone of their own is a terrible idea. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I guess I'm on the fence here. Uh, I, I think the timeline for integration into the national airspace of 2015 seems like a good timeline for me, knowing how regulation works and things like that. Um, and, and so I'm happy just to let it do its thing. I know that's not quick enough for what some people want to do. Um, and, and, and I do think that there should be space for, you know, relaxing and somewhat quickly some of these restrictions. Like for right now, you know, you, if you're 400 feet outside three miles of an airport and for recreational purposes, you know, you could do, you, you, you could operate one of these things. But in the second, you know, someone had mentioned this, the second you do it for educational research or, or commercial purposes, it's all of a sudden illegal. And I think we got to explore ways of relaxing that a bit before we have this full integration. I don't, I don't have good answers there yet. Um, you know, the certificate of authorization process is, is really onerous, but I think it is because you come from the safety point of view, um, either things flying out of the sky, you have these, you know, clouds of lawnmowers um, and things like that. And um, you know, so I, I don't have a good answer. I, I'm not gonna say we should encourage it, but I also don't wanna say we should discourage it. You know, I really would like to see it, you know, do its thing. Certainly me as a technologist, um, I am totally fascinated by them, and if we were in a single income family, I would probably have one in Tacoma Park, you know, getting stuck in trees. Like, there was this great picture you may have seen where a guy, a videographer, got his stuck in Lady Liberty's sword in Marion County, Ohio, and he was sitting there for a week. Someone helped me get it down, and they were like, We're not going to help you get you essentially right. what, what I was calling your lost frisbee. Um, and so I think, you know, that's something I hadn't predicted, but yeah, of course, these things are going to get stuck all over the place. Anyway. Okay, let's open it to questions. Yes, yeah, sir, in the back right there from the the drone user group. 
Woo, user group. I'm uh, still Timothy Reuter, president of the DC <coughs> area drone user group. And I love the title of this panel, uh, A Drone of One's Own, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. We try and train as many people as possible to build and operate their own drones. And I invite everyone here, if you're interested in doing that, check out dcdrone.org. And we're happy to help you with that. But I do have an actual question, um, which is I, I'd like to actually get your advice. Because we have this funny situation in the US right now where members of our group are allowed to do a lot of things that the people who are sitting up here are not. So I'd be interested to get your perspective how we might best be able to responsibly use this opportunity to drive innovation in this space. What are the things that you're not allowed to do because you're affiliated with institutions that you'd like to see groups like ours doing to have a positive impact with this technology under this recreational exception? Because we like to help people this is, recreationally. This is definitely for the other guys, so I'll just make a funny comment, which is I'd love to be able to deliver 50 copies of written testimony to the Hill without having to pay a courier. So, you know, if we can get a, a drone to do that, awesome. Yeah. I can make a funny comment as well. That the, the beer delivery, I think there's a real serious weight to power consumption problem here that we need to talk about. I think whiskey is probably the more optimal <laughs> delivery vehicle here. Um, that said, um, I would take uh, I would take a uh, I would take a page from the uh, the open source movement. Post your code, post your result, post your results. Write about what you do, uh, make it all public, um, put it all out there so that people can see it. Um, people like me, people uh, you know who, who are are doing research, people who are uh, in this kind of regulatory environment, and see that hey, this can be done, and it's not so scary. Um, that, that's what I would do. I agree. It's about education, letting people know the capabilities, and about good quality R&D. And they're in a position to do it for us. They really are. Most of these companies started off in a garage. Right. And that's the way it's going to be done. Uh, and I would also say test cases. You know, to the extent you think that, that something shouldn't be prohibited, I mean, it may take just as long to get through the judicial system as it would to, you know, wait for regulation to happen, but that could be another way. So, you know, work with nonprofits that bring litigation to, to actually try and challenge some of this stuff. Okay. Okay. More questions? Yeah, right here. Hi, I'm uh, William Angel. Um, in a legal and journalism sense, is there and should there be a difference between having a camera in your hand or, you know, on a backpack strap is there a difference between that and having a drone flying over your head or 10 feet over your head? And should, that, should there be a legal and journalistic difference? Good question. Uh, uh, again, not a lawyer, but I follow a lot of them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> my sense is that yes. Uh, in terms of uh, private property uh, law and um, things like that, generally people own, uh, you, you don't own up to the end of the universe above your property. Uh, it ends at the national airspace. So there's a, there's a gigantic capital Q question of what happens between, you know, above your arm and 400 feet. Um, can I look? Can, if I can see something from a public street or something like that, is it, is it fair game? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that area has actually ever been explored, uh, and it would be uh, fascinating. And I think, again, everybody and their brother is going to get sued. So this is going to be one of those novel areas where, where this is going to where this is going to come into play. And I think, going back to this this drone federalism idea, there are a number of states that would say, absolutely, you own that kind of invisible wall, uh, you know, at the edge of your property, up to 400 feet, um, and poking a camera into it, there are, there are some states that actually where that would be illegal. Uh, photographing into somebody's property is already uh, a misdemeanor crime. So yeah, we're, uh, we're into some interesting ground here. Yeah, and, and legally, there's, legally there's a bunch of different things going on here. <clears throat> there's been a bunch of sort of um, Fourth Amendment cases, which means government you know, collecting information about possible illegality where some of it said, you know, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy from being imaged from publicly navigable airspace. Um, others have said, look, they spent eight hours and like took 
thousands of pictures without getting a warrant, that's not right. Um, and there, you know, there's other things like this notion of privacy in public, and I'm sure there's, there's legal minds in this room that know this stuff way better than me, but you know, there's a Georgia Supreme Court case where they actually found you know, that, that photographing a woman's underwear in public, she was still had a reasonable expectation of privacy. You know, we have private areas that we carry with us and stuff like that. Anyway, so it's pretty complicated, but I think there is a, a, a significant difference. And you know, the con the, the people constantly talk about you know, manned aircraft versus drones, what's the difference? You know, that's an even clearer cut, you know, situation. The lower cost, you know, the, there's, there's the, uh, you know, the fact that they can do things human pilots can't do, go between buildings and stuff like that. I, I do think that there, there's a pretty big difference there. John, thoughts on if it's, if it's different the way he describes? Not, not, not really. I think <laughs> it depends what you do with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you do good with it and you're filming a story, that's one thing. I think it depends how far they take it. Like mm -hmm. you said, when they go into that protected area, that's where you're crossing the line. Uh, would, are the, the, your associations as chiefs of police, they have guidelines for yes. telling individual communities, like, this is how you should police drones or keep yeah, an eye on Yes, I mean, we, they, we have that. We also say we want you to use a reverse 911 system. We want you to call, contact people, hey, we are operating a UAS in this area, and this is what's going on. We want them to do that. We also wanted to make sure it's high visibility paint, you know, paint schemes on it and lighting and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're letting them know, hey, we're up, we're up there doing it. You know. Zero data retention, you know, you, unless it's for criminal investigation exactly. and evidence, don't yeah. keep anything. Don't and keep that, anything. That, that's really, from, right. from, a, from my perspective, that's so awesome. Right. Okay, sir, here in the front. You, because I missed you last time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Joel Garrow from Arizona State University in New America. Charles Krauthammer has said that the first person to use a Second Amendment weapon to blow one of these things out of the sky over his backyard is going to become an American folk hero. What do you think of that? Uh, it's already been done. Uh, it's been done twice to my knowledge. Um, there was a, uh, an animal rights group that uh, took issue with a number of private hunt clubs that were having these kind of canned dove hunts uh, where they just put a bunch of doves in a box, they open the box up, they go up, they shoot them with shotguns. Um, they had a, a small, it was a, a six rotor multi-copter uh, and they were over a public highway and they were trying to film this going on and exactly what you think happened began happening and you started hearing shots ring out and you know, a, you know, a, a, a light gauge shotgun from that distance, it took a pretty good shot to take one down and sure enough, hit a motor and Actually, you know, credit to the pilot, he was able to kind of put it in this auto rotation and get down to the ground and land without it crashing and nobody getting hurt. They started yelling at each other across the fence. You know, hey, we got your drone, uh, you know. So, yeah, there was a, a, prior to that, they had done the same thing at a different place. It got shot down and crashed on the property of the hunt club. The hunt club refused to let them go on there and get it. That thing is still to this day hanging in a tree and is the subject of a court case uh, over it. So. I hate to say it, but Charles is kind of behind the kind of curve here. People have already been shooting these yeah. things down. Yeah, in Australia and too. There's cattle ranchers in Australia that have actually said, if we see any of these um, over our land, we're going to blow them out of the sky. So maybe what he he needs is a especially public um, display, like maybe a, a Dick Cheney or something. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, it's, I, I do a, a number of, uh, of interviews with other media about this. They call me up and ask me about this stuff all the time. And I can almost guarantee you that within the first two comments on the story, there's somebody saying, oh, I'm going to get my shotgun out and shoot it down. <laughs> it's just uh, predictable as it can be. Um, part of me says, take a crack sport. If you can hit it, good on you. Um, but um, there are, I, I have a lot of kind of open questions about things that go up must come down and suddenly you're putting a lot of bullets in the air and that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, look at any city on, on New Year's Eve, it's a, it's a really desperately bad idea. Um, but it's a common feeling. This is, this is your nightmare. I, yeah. I absolutely, whether it's our UAS or our, an agency's UAS, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you're talking reckless endangerment at some point and then it, Gets a little crazy. I mean, but it's going to happen. I can pretty much guarantee it. Right. Someone's going to shoot at it. So. Okay. So. Well, we've reached the end of our time for this panel, so I want to thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you.